And uh, last week, he got a lot of buzz. Mitt Romney gave a speech to the NAACP convention. It was uh, very interesting, to say the least. A lot of interesting reactions from the crowd and a lot of analysis of it. But this week on America's Evil Genius, I wanted to give you the speech or the idea that Mitt Romney should have given the NAACP. We'll talk about that in detail this week. But first, the America's Evil Genius World Tour continues in full effect. I've got a lot of appearances coming up over the next couple of weeks, so let's give you a chance to see where I'm going to be. And hey, you can even pick up one of the official America's Evil Genius t-shirts. Here is where I'll be appearing. One, two, three, four. She don't change Or I don't notice you change I think about it every day But only for a little while And then the feeling Okay, so Mitt Romney gives a speech to the NAACP, and first things first, before I tell you the speech he should have made, or the ideas that he should have brought about in that speech, I am going to give Mitt Romney credit where it's due. Now, those of you who have watched this show for any length of time at all, or you've seen very many of these episodes, you undoubtedly are aware that I'm not a real big fan of Mitt Romney, that I don't trust Mitt Romney. I, 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 I'm not fully trusting of him. I, I couldn't warm up to him if we were cremated together. And so I've had my doubts about him from day one. I'm sort of voting for him under duress. But I must say this, that during his speech to the NAACP, there was a point where Mitt firmly and unequivocally stated that he was going to repeal Obamacare. And that statement got a huge round of boos from the crowd. They didn't like it. And to, to Mitt Romney's credit, he did not back off the statement. He did not back down, try to qualify it, or anything like that. He stuck by his guns. So, you know, for what might be a, a rare occasion in this campaign, what well, might be one of the first times in this campaign, Mitt Romney did certainly show a little bit of backbone on a key issue. And uh, for one day at least, really did st stand by what the conservatives and what the Republicans want him to stand for in this election. Time will tell if he stays with that, of course, but I certainly hope that it's a positive sign. And on top of that, Mitt's overall message was not bad. He did illustrate, I think, a, a vision for African-American communities and African-American families that I thought was largely a good one. He said in his speech, and I'm going to quote from Mr. Romney here, he says, I want you to know that if I did not believe that my policies and my leadership would help families of color and families of any color more than the policies and leadership of President Obama, I would not be running for president. Well, you know, I agree with Mitt Romney there. I agree that, generally speaking, the policies of a Republican president, particularly a conservative president, although calling Romney a conservative presidential candidate is a stretch to say the least, I believe that those policies would be more uh, beneficial to all Americans, African Americans included, than those of a Democratic Party. So give him credit for that, a good basic speech. But my issue here is that I think there was a great opportunity with this moment. I think there was a great opportunity for Mitt Romney or any other conservative with this particular audience. I think that going beyond just saying, here's a, a very basic overview of why my policies won't hurt you, I think there's an opportunity to give a deeper analysis to this audience of the results of African-American loyalty to the Democratic Party and to liberalism over the last 50 years. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, we talked on this show before about how solid of a voting block the African-American community is for the Democratic Party. In any presidential election that you want to name for the last 50 plus years, you can go back and see that African-Americans voted for the Democratic candidate 80% of the time, 90% of the time, or even more. It's virtually unanimous 
in terms of statistics, how the African-American vote goes. If you can get African-Americans in the polls, you can almost be assured, in modern times anyway, that they'll vote for the Democrat. And that has been happening since roughly the 1960s. Certainly it kind of started with FDR, but it really ratcheted up in the 1960s with LBJ and the Great Society, Lyndon Johnson. And it's been solid ever since. Now, why is that? Well, many would point to civil rights, and uh, there's certainly a history there, but I think in the modern context, that's overstated just a little bit. I mean, both parties had uh, people who were for civil rights and against them. Both parties had people who were for Jim Crow and against it. Both parties had a lot of infighting over that issue. And to be quite frank with you, all of those people in Washington back in those days who were for Jim Crow or for segregation, to be quite frank with you, all of them are now out of public office and the good majority of them are dead. So that particular issue really has zero relevance, nada, in today's political environment. So that leaves the question of economics. And if you're asking the question of why African Americans have been so uh, loyal to the Democratic Party over the last half century, the Democrats would likely tell you that among other things, African Americans have gravitated towards the left because they have been held down economically prior to the 1960s, even, even all the way through America. They would tell you that the, need is, that the need is there in the African American community for government help in order to escape that poverty. They would paint the picture for you that the poverty and pathology in the African American community has been there all along. That it's been there going all the way back to the Civil War and before. That it goes back to day one. But is that actually true? Is that historically accurate? Well, a quick look at the facts shows that it's not. So a lot of people out there who have done a, a tremendous amount of research on this, and uh, among them, you've heard me mention on this show before, Walter E. Williams, T Dr. Thomas Sowell. If you, if you ever have a chance to pick up any of their books, any of their columns, any of their works on this topic, it is well worth your time. And among the statistics you will see in those works are some very interesting statistics that come out right before the time of the Great Society, right before the 1960s, right before the decade that the African Americans almost in total went over to the Democratic Party. Again, we are always told that this happened because of economic issues, but is that really true? Well, let's look at the 20 years right before the Great Society, right before this mass migration of African Americans over to the Democratic Party. Between the years of 1940 and 1960, Poverty among black families fell from 87% to 47%. Okay, looking at a roughly similar time period here, 1936 to 1959, the incomes of blacks relative to whites more than doubled during that time period. Also in 1940, 86% of black children were born inside of marriage. Today, that's down to 31%. Now, what this means, and I've, I've just shouted a lot of statistics off to you real quick, you're probably trying to process them all. But what this means in a general sense is that in spite of the significant challenges that African Americans faced prior to the 1960s, in spite of things like Jim Crow and segregation and rampant racism and all of the like, in spite of all of those things, African Americans were still impressively climbing the ranks of America during that time period. Much like the Irish and the Germans and many others had done before them, much like a lot of Asian Americans have done since that time. So it really pokes a, a, a humongous hole in that theory that African Americans have been economically and consistently disadvantaged for the entire history of this country. There was a time right before the 1960s, right before the Great Society, right before the mass migration of the Democratic Party, that African Americans were rising through the ranks and they were poised to make their mark. But then the Democrats got a hold of them and then the Great Society happened. So what happened after that time period? Well, the number of people living below the poverty line overall had been declining continuously prior to 1960, but it started increasing after the Great Society. And you know, the Great Society, if you go back and read the history books, the Great Society of Lyndon Johnson was sold to everybody on the idea that it would only be a temporary uh, reliance on government for the poor. Well, so much for that idea when you see that uh, number of people below the poverty line increasing after the implementation of the program. The number of people in public assistance doubled between 1960 and 1977. And those numbers were magnified within the African American communities where much of those programs were aimed. Not to mention inner city schools, which anybody today would, would tell you are, are just among the worst in the nation and just it's so difficult to get a quality education there. And today that's very true. 
But it hasn't always been that way. You know, we forget that many inner city or, quote, black schools delivered a quality education back before the liberal onslaught of our schools began in the 1960s. Likewise, a lot of uh, rural schools and a lot of more, if you hate to use the term, but more white schools also uh, did that same thing, offered a uh, quality education. In his writings, Thomas Sowell recalls many of these schools. Schools in which, uh, black schools if you want to call them that, in which test scores were comparable or even better than some white schools of the same time period. He recalls specifically a, a school called Dunbar High School in Washington, D.C. that had tremendous test results long before the 1960s, where a lot of distinguished alumni came out of, where a lot of kids went to college and where they performed as well or better than white schools in the Washington area. All of this despite having far less in terms of money and resources. On the other side of the coin, I know people, my own parents, for example, that went to one-room schoolhouses in rural America, and I would say that they got a better education than all of the well-funded elementary schools you see today. Why? Because you have the influx of liberal educational philosophy that started in the 1960s and has plagued us ever since. And yet when you go back to those inner city schools today, many of those that were the same schools that were so good in Thomas Sowell's time and are still around, the test scores in those schools, the test scores among those African-American students, the performance of those students has dropped through the basement. But it hasn't always been that way. It hasn't been a state factor. It's a relatively recent development. Now these are just two areas, schools and income. Just two areas where the American left has promised to improve life for African Americans during the last century. But the empirical evidence, as we have just shown, demonstrates that just the opposite has happened. Liberal programs and ideology have resulted in the pathology that exists in the African American communities in the inner cities today. A pathology that did not exist, at least to a significant degree, in the years prior to the Great Society, in the years prior to the mass African-American migration to the Democratic Party in the 1960s. And now on top of it all, you have a sitting Democratic president who is vilifying all business owners with his comments earlier this week claiming that business owners don't build anything. Now that's a comment that's not only going to be insulting to the mythical 1% in America, it's also going to be insulting to every single business owner, large and small in this nation, successful or struggling in this nation, including those business owners in the inner city who are trying to help turn things around. And your sitting Democratic president is telling them that they're not building anything. I firmly believe that most African Americans, just like most members of any other group that you would like to name, want to be rewarded for their hard work, want to be able to provide opportunities and a good life to their children beyond that which they have had themselves, that they wish to live in environments where crime does not pay and respect for the law does, they wish to put the needs of their families ahead of the needs of some vague collective. Those ideas are not just a black or a white thing. They're not a Hispanic thing, an Asian thing. They're not a female thing. They're not a male thing. They're a human thing. They're wants and needs and desires that every single one of us have and justifiably so. And these are the needs and desires and wants that are the aim of conservatism in this modern era for all people, not just for one or two specific groups. What Mitt Romney should have done, or what I would like to have seen him do, is to give this message to African Americans, to give this message to the NAACP and all, of, all others who are watching him. The message being this, we on the right, we in the conservative movement, we in the Republican Party do not see you or judge you as a group the way that the Democrats do. Instead, we see you and judge you as individuals. On your individual merits, on your individual accomplishments, and on the individual content of your character, not unlike the dreams that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had. Now, would such a message have worked on those at the NAACP convention? I doubt it, highly unlikely. Let's face it, those who are in the NAACP today and who were at that convention largely have had their mind made up not only about the presidential race, but about conservatism in the Republican Party for a long time now. But the visibility of giving such a message in that environment may have lit a spark among younger African Americans, 
among those younger people within that community who have not yet been poisoned by the NAACP or who have not yet been poisoned by the Democratic Party or who have not yet been poisoned by the American left or who have not yet been poisoned by other liberal victim cults. And that's where the value in this message is over the long term. The value is with those future generations of African Americans and frankly everybody else who wish to succeed by embracing individualism, capitalism, and conservatism. And in the case of African Americans, embracing those three things and experiencing success in a way that their parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents over the last half century have largely failed. That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius. We'll see you next week.